So it is my distinct privilege to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Steve Bowman. Thank you, Justin. Good afternoon, everybody. seven months before that I was a law professor for over two decades so I reserved the right to cold call on any of you so you better pay attention to what I'm saying today and I hope you all have done the reading. Um, no, it is a, a pleasure to be here. One other announcement I wanted to make for those of us uh, who are out of, are out of state guests Despite what you've heard about the way things happen in Tennessee, if during the Q&A period you speak out of turn, you will not be expelled. Okay, so I'm sure that's um, no further comments here. So, uh, seriously, on that note, actually, as a proud Memphian, I'm really honored uh, that an organization as prestigious as this one would choose Memphis for its annual uh, meeting. And I hope it is not the case that any of you have had cause to regret that uh, decision. Uh, I know I have heard that there are some people that had talked about a boycott of Tennessee because of the recent events in the state legislature. I will acknowledge that uh, this may not necessarily be a boon time for justice and civil rights in the volunteer state. But what I'd like to say is choosing Memphis in particular may be quite appropriate. Uh, because I think recent experience has shown that even when we have real challenges in justice and real challenges in civil rights and real tragedy in those areas, nonetheless, some positive reforms are able to emerge. And so that's what I'd like to uh, do today is make that argument. And I'll do it by talking about the case that has been receiving a lot of attention here today, the tragic death of Tyree Nichols and how the system responded to that death and what implications we might have going forward. And I'd like to do that by trying to draw three lessons from Tyree Nichols' tragedy. First, we can pick up the pace. Second, we can be more transparent. And third, we can be more strategic. So let me start with the first of the three lessons. We can pick up the pace. Normally, many months would elapse before we got to anything remotely like a resolution in a case like the Tiger Eagles case. Video would not be released until the investigation was completed many, 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 many months down the line. And if charges actually were brought, then possibly not for much further, further until the case was finally exposed. This kind of delay can fuel suspicion and undermine confidence in the fairness of the criminal justice system. This public confidence was already at a low level nationally in the wake of George Floyd. And polling data showed that was certainly the case here in Memphis and Shelby County, particularly among the African American community. And for good reason. Like many other places around the country, we have real severe racial disparities in our criminal justice system at every stage. The Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, my former employer, sued our juvenile court some years back for widespread equal protection and due process problems, resulting in the appointment of a federal court appointed independent monitor that had found systemic racial discrimination in our juvenile court system. Restoring that public confidence was a key part of my campaign and a key part of my mission as a new DA. I see it important not only as an end in and of itself, but as a means to an end in terms of public safety. Something that was actually mentioned coincidentally in one of the panels just a few minutes ago. When the community does not have confidence in the fairness of the system, then they will not be inclined to cooperate with law enforcement. By restoring that public confidence, we can try to reignite that cooperation. I'm talking about providing tips. Uh, reporting crime, serving as witnesses. That really, more than anything else, is what we need to bend the curve on violent crime, which in Memphis, like in many of the cities around the country, has been rising steadily over the last few years. So, what did we do? What was the time frame? 
Well, in the Tyree Nichols case, we immediately brought in the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation for an independent investigation. DOJ announced its own parallel federal investigation within 11 days. The Memphis Police Department fired the officers involved within two weeks. We allowed the family to come in and view the footage and meet with the district attorney. Within 16 days of the tragic incident and 13 days of the tragic death, and we announced indictments within three weeks. This was an extraordinary case for an extraordinary case. Public outcry was at a record high, as was national interest. Unnecessary delay clearly would have fueled precisely that distrust in the fairness of the system that I talked about a moment ago. And so what we did, and I'm very proud to say, that we did a speedy and thorough review and led to what I think is a fair decision. You know, the national uh, prominent civil rights attorney Ben Crump famously said not too long ago on CNN, in the presence of uh, Mrs. Uh, Wells, the mother of Tyree Nichols, that the way we responded to that case was, quote, a blueprint for the nation, unquote. I'm extraordinarily proud of that, and I am proud of my staff, as many of whom are here today, uh, and the way that they reacted to that situation and that pressure. Now, I'm the first to acknowledge that this extraordinary case is not possible in every case. For one thing, resources are limited. For another, the facts are not always clear. Good video isn't always available. Shades of gray are bound to emerge. Or the case can hinge on forensic evidence that is taking a long time to come back from the lab, something which is beyond the control of investigators or prosecutors. And those of you who are local in Tennessee know it's been a real issue here in Tennessee, undue delays in getting back those kinds of forensic tests. Despite that, though, I think we have to acknowledge that police-involved killings deserve special priority because of that very risk to public confidence. As a general rule, punishment need not always be severe, but it must always be swift and certain. That is true in the garden variety criminal case bits, especially true in cases where the very people who may be potential defendants are the very people who are sworn to uphold the law and who have given have been given by the state a monopoly on the use of force. Every week that goes by without action, when which authorities are silent, suspicion and rumors can grow. So for that reason, police and prosecutors need to make every effort to expedite these kinds of cases. And this also involves the mechanics or logistics of our grand juries and courts to accommodate that speed. In those cases, we need to strive to reach decision in a fair number of weeks, not an unfair number of months. And this often will be possible when the use of force is clearly unjustified or clearly justified, for that matter. And as to that latter situation, the justified use of force, I'd like to point out that speed is just as important there, and it is important to law enforcement that we act speedily. Because prosecutors, if they ultimately conclude that the force is justified, the public needs to know that as soon as possible to allay suspicions, to clear the officers' names, and to allow officers who are on suspension, suspension to get back on the line and help the public safety. All right, lesson two. We can be more transparent. As a general rule, video in this case is where it's available. It should be released as soon as possible as long as it doesn't interfere with the ongoing investigation. This requires both the people investigating the case, in this case the TBI, and prosecutors to help in completing interviews and tracking down witnesses on a compressed timeline, specifically so that the video releasing occur soon without interfering. Now, fortunately in our case, this was not a case where there was third party available from a citizen who had the ability to just Time their own release. And it's useful to make sure we understand how the premature release of the video can interfere with an ongoing investigation. A question that I had to answer to the media over and over and over again during that three week period where pressure was mounting for release of the video. As a general rule, you don't, you don't want bad faith um, inter witness uh, interviewees to be able to tailor what they say to law enforcement 
based on what they already know law enforcement has. We don't want to show our cards that quickly. And even good faith witnesses, there's a danger that they might get confused as to what they actually remember witnessing and what they saw on TV. But where public interest is high, we don't need to exhaustively complete the investigation before we can release the video. What we need to do is make sure that key witness interviews are completed, with key witness being defined as the kinds of people whose testimony might be influenced if they see the video, the people who were otherwise there. Now, there were some two interesting legal issues that came up in our case. I think there may be analogs to them on the parts of the jurisdiction, maybe not. Um, one is that there was a rule of criminal procedure and a Tennessee Supreme Court case which had previously been interpreted to say that we could not release this kind of information. The only way that we could release it would be to a party in the case as part of the normal criminal discovery process. I had determined that those authorities actually only spoke to whether a third party would be entitled to require disclosure of the information and in no way interfered with our ability to voluntarily disclose the information. And I subsequently was able to consult with the State Attorney General's office on that, and they agree with my interpretation of those authorities. The other legal issue is that there is a state statute here in Tennessee which authorizes release of a Tennessee of Bureau investigation report in an officer-involved case, but only after the TBI has totally completed its investigation, and even then only in the case of an officer-involved shooting. It specifically speaks only about officer-involved shootings. It would not apply in a case in which the suspect, for example, was beaten to death. But I determined that while that might apply to our office as to the materials that we would receive from TBI as part of its ongoing investigation, it did not, in fact, apply to an independent, separate entity like the Memphis Police Department that was the original custodian of the video record in the first instance. And fortunately, Memphis Police Department agreed with that interpretation. They were also keen on releasing the video quickly, but they wanted to make sure that they had sign off from me, from our office, because they didn't want to compromise the investigation. All right, lesson three, we can be more strategic. With this case, like all officer-involved fatality cases that we now have here in Shelby County, I tasked my newly created Justice Review Unit, the JRU, to make an initial recommendation as to whether charges were appropriate. The JRU is what you might think of as a conviction integrity unit, only the second in the state of Tennessee to be uh, created, whose primary mission is to go back and see if there were wrongful convictions or wrongful sentences and provide proper correction. Because a large part of their view, uh, their work would be to look, go back and look at our office and see whether we screwed up, a Brady violation, for example, or something of that nature, it is important to maintain objectivity and independence. So, consistent with best national practices, our JRU is designed to be separate and independent. They do not work regularly with law enforcement. They do not work regularly with the rest of the office. In fact, they're housed physically separately and report solely and directly only to me. Our particular JRU has a somewhat broader mandate than the typical conviction integrity unit you might have heard about over the last decade or so. We look not only to correct wrongful convictions, but also wrongful sentences. But more relevant to today's talk, I had also decided to task them with the decision in all officer-involved fatality cases to make that initial recommendation about whether the Act force was justified or whether criminal charges were appropriate or something else. That very objectivity and independence that I just spoke about in the normal instance, I think, is crucial also and appropriate when we're making decisions about whether to charge law enforcement officials that we work with on a regular basis. And throughout this process, we had different types of strategic partnerships. We had partnerships among local, state, and federal law enforcement, as well as the U.S. Attorney's Office. We met regularly to discuss our joint investigation over that short period of time and are still consulting. Further, I met repeatedly with clergy and activists and other community stakeholders, some of whom you heard from earlier today in the beginning of the plenary session. 
In fact, at one point, I was meeting with a large group of ministers before we decided to announce the charges in a conference room in my office, a large group of them, when I suddenly got word that there were a group of protesters who had taken over my lobby, quite loudly. So what I decided to do was to invite them in. And I had them come in and mix in with the ministers, and we had a broad-ranging discussion while my comms team and my security personnel gritted their teeth and held their tongues. Uh, throughout this process, I was also being told, maybe a little bit later on in that three-week period, by a number of different people, activists, uh, legislators, former law enforcement persons, that I needed to be very careful about releasing this video if there were no charges because of the incendiary response. Everyone was worried about a violent response because word had gotten out about how just, how potentially incendiary the, the video might be, put it that way. Um, as we moved quickly to complete those key witness interviews, we began to realize that our office might be able to make charging decisions on a short time frame. And that's when we decided that we would announce charges first and then arrange for release of the video. And, suffice it to say, I think it worked. The nation had braced for a violent reaction. Everyone was talking about an anticipated violent reaction. They were worried about a violent reaction, not only in Memphis, but around the country. And while there were indeed very vigorous protests, understandably vigorous protests even, here and in major cities around the country, they were peaceful. I credit two main reasons for this. The first one is the extraordinary grace that was shown by Tyree Nichols' parents, particularly Mrs. Wells, and their public statements urging calm. And the second is because the protesters knew that there was actually going to be accountability at the time they saw and reacted to the video. And actually, I lied. When it comes to Memphis, there's a third reason that I think I need to mention. And this is one of the reasons why I had been predicting no violent response in the days leading up to the release of the video. And that is that Memphis activists have a long and de decades long and proud tradition of peaceful protest. Just in my time here, being involved in local politics, I remember in 2016, they took over one of our bridges in response to the uh, killings of Philando Castillo <coughs> and Alton Sterling. And more recently, they took over City Hall Plaza in response to the death of George Floyd. All of those protests were peaceful. All right, I lied again. I said there were three lessons. I'm going to throw in one bonus lesson before I conclude. And that lesson is, it's not just a few bad apples. The Tyree Nichols case rightfully sparked a nationwide conversation about police use of force and police reform. Whatever one concludes about criminal regarding, uh, liability regarding any individual, I think it's fair to conclude that suspect practices are not the work of one or two rogue outliers. As has been mentioned by other people today during this conference, there is a culture that needs to be changed. This obviously is not just limited to Memphis. Over 1,000 people are killed by police every year, with the number rising in the last few years. And although the vast majority are harmed, and that's important to emphasize, to be fair to the police, Black people are three times more likely to be the victims of these kinds of police officer killings. And only a small fraction of the killings of unarmed individuals are ever prosecuted, ever result in criminal prosecutions. Even more interesting, I think, personally, is just how much of a sharp outlier we are in the United States compared to the rest of the world. Our rate is three times higher per capita than Canada, 60 times, not 16, 60 times higher per capita compared to the UK. In 2015, there were more US police killings in the first 24 days than there were in the UK and Wales over the previous 24 years. Now, part of that global disparity is the proliferation of guns in America, a uniquely American problem and dysfunction, and something that police have no control over. But part of it, I think we need to acknowledge, is a warrior culture that insufficiently emphasizes de-escalation and mental health expertise. We need fewer urban tanks and more mobile health labs. 
We need less battle rattle and more white coats. Finding remedies to this problem is really more of a question of political will than it is in finding some mysterious, elusive solution. The solutions are out there. I think a good start is the George Floyd Act. Many of you are familiar with it. Among other things, it would change the mens rea standard for federal civil rights violations by law enforcement officials from willful to reckless. It would provide much needed and long overdue limits on qualified immunity, an entirely judge-made doctrine that has really no basis in text or history. It would give my former employer, the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division Administrative Subpoena Power in pattern and practice investigations. It would lead to the demilitarization of our police departments. We would stop giving out tanks and battle rattle to uh, local law enforcement organizations. And it would provide that for federal law enforcement agents and local law enforcement agents who are receiving federal funding, such things as a duty to intervene, a ban on chokeholds, and restrictions on no-knock warrants. This experience has led to a lively reform debate here in Memphis, and I want to give credit, you know, some of these things, like the duty to intervene, for example, are things that have already been embraced by the Memphis Police Department in response to the protests after the George Floyd uh, killing. Um, our police chief recently has acknowledged the need for improved training and supervision in the wake of the Tyree Nichols case. Our city council has passed helpful ordinances doing such things as limiting pretextual traffic stops, requiring more data reporting for all such traffic stops, and beefing up the powers for civilian <coughs> review boards, one of the things that I have been pushing for years. Although I am sad to report that even though that has happened, a new law has just recently passed in the Tennessee legislature that would largely neuter those civilian review, review board reforms. But despite a few instances of progress here locally, we have more to do, both here in Memphis and Shelby County and around the country. One reform I'd like to see is a provision in all budgets establishing a set amount for civil liability damages awards that police departments have to be responsible for, based on, say, an average of those awards over the last X number of years. If, in a given year, the damage awards exceeded that amount, it should be deducted from the police budget. But if they come in under budget, then they can use it as a surplus, trying to provide an actual, real, fiscal incentive to do what's right. Now, I know some places, including Memphis, may claim that that is, in fact, the way it works. It doesn't really work that way, because when they do go over, all they have to do is go back to the government and get more money from other sources. What I'm talking about is real consequences, budgetary consequences, on a year-by-year -year basis. I also think that the Memphis Police Department and the Shelby County Sheriff's Office and all law enforcement agencies that experience avoidable in custody deaths should engage in what is called a sentinel event review, such as those pioneered by the University of Pennsylvania's prestigious Quattrone Center for Fair Administration of Justice. <laughs> Model after similar after action reviews that occur in the transportation and medical indus industries after, say, for example, a plane crash or an operating table death. The idea is that you gather together all of the stakeholders. In this case, that would be law enforcement, local government, prosecutors, defense bar, members of the community, for a non-blame-seeking, candid, root cause assessment of what systemic failures led to the avoidable deaths and what systemic reforms could, as a practical matter, prevent the next one. Sentinel inventory reviews of this type have been proven helpful in other cities, including Philadelphia, Minneapolis, and Madison, Wisconsin, to name just a few. And while I think the city is to be commended for inviting in the Department of Justice's COPS program, that stands for Community Oriented Policing Strategies, to review certain types of policies on a non-binding, voluntary basis, such a review is commendable and necessary, but in my view, not sufficient. Sentinel review participants are more wide-ranging and move beyond mere review of policies at the policy level to a deeper, granular examination of how those policies are implemented on the ground. And for similar reasons, 
I believe it's appropriate. I've been asked this question by many people, and I'm happy to answer it. I'm not keeping any secrets. I think it's appropriate for the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice to launch a pattern and practice investigation, which could lead to a consent decree and an independent monitor. If we really want to address what we all acknowledge to be a systemic problem and further truly lasting change, half measures simply won't do. So let me stop there because I only, not only did I give you three lessons, I gave an extra bonus lesson because I indulge myself and I don't want to go over the time. Um, but I do want to end on a, a more, I don't know, positive note and uh, doing something that I think has become part of my brand. Those of you who are former students or colleagues of the law school know that I ended every class during my law school career with a limerick, which summarized the lesson. I made great use of it during the campaign and I've continued to use it in my last seven months as DA. So let me end with a custom-made limerick for all of you today. Thank you all for giving me the time as you ponder the justice of crime. Once you're all through, enjoy some great barbecue. You can mark it as a billable time. Thank you very much.